Hi, welcome to First United Methodist Church Online Worship. I'm Tim Roberts. I'm the pastor here, and it's such a joy to be able to welcome you as we gather together from our homes, from parks, from different places across the world, and we come together to worship and praise Jesus Christ. I only have one announcement for you this morning. Please, if you subscribe to our Facebook page, look at the Facebook post for they will contain information about uh, prayers and praises that we want to share with you. Also, our web page, our emails, our phone trees, all of these are ways that we're trying to keep you connected with one another and in the life of this church. So take a look at those and continue to pray as we are separated, and soon we will be back together again. Well, brothers and sisters, this is the day the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Life is like a mountain railway With an engineer that's brave We must make the run successful From the cradle to the grave Watch the hills, the curves and tunnels Never falter, never fail Keep your hands upon the throttle And your eye upon the rail Oh, blessed Savior, that will guide us When the angels come to join us in God's grace forevermore. As you roll across the trestle, spanning Jordan, swelling tide, you behold the Union Depot into which your train will ride. There you meet the railroad master. God the Father, God the Son, with a hearty, joyous greeting, weary pilgrim, welcome home. Oh, blessed Savior, that will guide us till we reach that blissful shore where the Join us in God's grace forevermore. In God's grace forevermore. As we enter into a time of prayer, I want to give you the opportunity to share with one another your prayer concerns, your praises. You may do this by typing your prayer concerns, your praises in the comment boxes that are right below us, and share those here on Facebook. Now, a couple things will happen. Others will see the, these and will be in prayer with you this week and celebrate with you this week, but also this week, Shannon will take a look at those and she will update our midweek uh, prayer concerns and we'll send those out by email. So please take this opportunity to share your uh, concerns, your praises. 
to this morning, I want to take this time of prayer to help us to join together in the prayer for, for some unity and peace here in our country and our community. So let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we know that you deserve all of the glory and praise. But right now we may resonate better with the words that a psalmist said. You have laid burdens on our back. Father, you know our burdens. We pray that you soften our hearts to open up to you, to be with you in our burdens. To to teach us to cry out to you and ask that you would comfort us and lighten our load. Jesus, we pray to those who are, we pray for those who are sick and dying and unable to be comforted by their loved ones. They're separated. We can't be with one another. So we ask for your supernatural presence to be felt and and known among those whom are perishing and even by the medical staff who are caring for them. And we ask that while chaplains can't be near, that your Holy Spirit will be pastoring to these people as they pass into eternity. And Father, we pray for those affected financially and economically by this crisis. We ask that where the church is stepping up to fill these needs, that you would increase their supply and provide mightily for the many. And we ask that your name would be made uh, much of in these efforts, both locally and globally. Spirit, we invite you to be present in our homes. Where there is domestic violence and such, we ask for safety. We ask that you wrap your protective arms at this moment around those who are suffering from abuse of any sort. We ask in the powerful name of Jesus that you would put a shield of protection around these victims in our neighborhoods, in our cities, our state, in our world. And put in, put it in the hearts of those near to these loved ones of yours. To stand up for the vulnerable and for the oppressed. And in so doing, glorify your name. Father, we ask for protection of our hearts. There's so much that's pulling on us right now. Stress from home, lack our jobs or lack thereof, decisions on who we see and interact with and how we can do such thing, and with the polarization of society on what is right and what is wrong in a pandemic or the racial protest. And these are just naming a few. Jesus, would you guide our hearts to take refuge in you? And as each of us draws closer to you, would you lead your church here and globally to understand and respect the myriad of concerns and actions that you lead people to take in the midst of crisis? May your body stand in unity even when we differ in thought and practice. And as we stand together in person, or by way of technology, or for some of us just in spirit. May we see that although today we, we feel the burdens of our back, on our back, that you are still good. And like that psalm goes on to say, you will bring us to a place of abundance. May we see and experience your abundance, even when our circumstances are hard because you are still good. Use these unique times to strip away what clouds our vision of you that we may truly see that you are glorious.
Father, put your praise on our lips at all times. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I want to invite you to continue to live into your vows of prayer, of virtual presence, of witness, of service, and of giving. You may offer your tithe, your offering, uh, either by mailing it in or by uh, electronic means. If you would visit our website, firstnw.org, and look across the top, the banner at the top, you'll see a place that says give and get involved. If you'll click that, it'll take you to a page where the center column will talk about how you may make your offering. If you'll do this, You'll be living in to supporting the ministries and the missions of this church, being a place of hope for this community. So now let us give to God what is God's as we give to him his tithes and our offerings. Take me in your life, Lord, oh, take me in your life, Lord. It will stand the raging storm. Take me in your life, boat. Oh, take me in your life, boat. It will bear my spirit home. Now, brothers and sisters, don't fall asleep. We pray night and day, or we'll sink in the deep. Fathers and mothers are praying so well.
I'm Andrew Casey. I'm the chair of the Staff Parish Relations Committee. Pastor Tim, on behalf of Staff Parish and on behalf of all the members here at First North Wilkesboro, we want to thank you for this time that you've shared your ministry with us. And we pray that the transition to your new congregation goes well. On behalf of the church, we have some gifts to give you. We have some pottery from the pottery studio of our very own Shannon Evans. We also have a love offering that we hope that uh, will help ease some of the financial strains during moving and setting up in a new parsonage. We want to thank you again for all that you've done for us and wish you the best in the future. Our prayers are with you and your family. Thank you, Tim. For those of you who know me well, you know that I'm a bit of a space buff. I believe it came from when I was a child sitting in front of the television watching those grainy black and white images of astronauts walking on the moon. Even as late as last month, I sat in front of my computer watching as SpaceX blasted off in uh, docked with the International Space Station. The video that started this time of meditation was of John Glenn's voyage into space when he was launched into orbit, to being the first person to be in orbit. And as he was being launched, Scott Carpenter at Mission Control uttered those haunting words, Godspeed, John Glenn almost issuing it like a prayer, asking God's presence to be with John on this historic voyage. But this morning, we're taking a, a voyage of our own. And so let's start by asking God to be with us as we uh, go to him in prayer and asking for God to be with us and to bless us. So I ask you to hold your hands out, palms up, as we assume a posture of expectancy. Pray this prayer with me. Lord, I offer myself to you. Open my ears to hear and my heart to receive all you have for me today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. See if you've heard these words before. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages, well, you know how it goes. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It was the opening dialogue or monologue of this TV show, Star Trek. Now, it went on, but the last words are kind of apt for today. To boldly go where no one has gone before. It kind of set it up as being a futuristic pioneering show and the reason it's applicable today is that we're pioneers in a way we're going to places that we have never been before never before have we experienced a shutdown caused by a virus like coronavirus has done for many of us, this is the first time we've really witnessed and experienced the civil unrest from racial protest and, and other types of uh, civil unrest. For many of us, this is the first time that we've experienced a, a schism within the church, uh, the, the, the pending division of the United Methodist Church. And for some, we've gone through a period of angst and anxiety within the local church here. 
a lot of pain and a lot of tears have been shed and now we're experiencing a pastoral shift and we feel alone that's what happens when we feel like we experience things that we've never felt before we feel like no one else has ever experienced this before and that we're all alone and there's no way anybody can understand what we're going through the thing is that none of that that I just said is unique to human society it was just about a hundred years ago that the world uh, was isolated because of the Spanish flu that killed millions. Then 20 years later, there was another epidemic of polio. In the late 50s and 60s, we had many racial unrest and protest. And in the 90s, we had the fall of the Soviet Union, and all of this came crashing in on us, and we felt afraid. Within our denomination, we feel like, oh my gosh, our, our church is being broken apart. Uh, what's going to happen if the United Methodist Church ceases to exist? And the thing is that Methodism started out of a schism. It's faced many breakups and it's, uh, it's experienced many bringing back together and other breakups and other reunions. This isn't the first time. And here at first... You know we've experienced uh, times of angst and anxiety, of pain and crying and, and upheaval. And I'm definitely not, uh, this is definitely not the first time that you've experienced a pastoral change. But yet whenever we go through these events, it feels like that we're all alone and that nobody understands us. And we wonder, what can we do? But like I said, we're not alone. Other generations ha have gone through issues like these before. And, and where, where the, the details may be a bit different, the feelings were the same, and mostly the outcomes have been the same. It was 72 years ago, 1948, when C.S. Lewis responded to uh, someone who had wrote him a letter uh, about their great crisis of the moment, the atomic bomb. Back in those days, uh, people were, were almost sure that it would be any day that atomic bombs would be raining down on their homes, and so they were quite scared. Now, listen to how Lewis responded to this letter. And... Whenever you hear the word atomic bomb, just replace it with something that causes you a great deal of angst and anxiety, like maybe coronavirus or the racial unrest or the schism of the United Methodist Church or even pastoral change. But listen to this. In one way, we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. How, we, how are we to live in an atomic age? Well, I'm tempted to reply. Why, as you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year. Or as you would have when the, if you had lived in the Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night. Or indeed, as you are already living in the age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented. And a quite high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. 
we had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestor, anesthetics. But we have that still. So it's perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering, drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of a painful and premature death to our world, which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made. And the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we're going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing our children, playing tennis, chatting with our friends over a pint or a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and, and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies. A microbe can do that. But they need not dominate our minds. I love the way that Lewis puts it into perspective, right? He reminds us that all the things that we worry about, we tend to over-exaggerate at times. Not to, to uh, diminish the severity or the importance of some of them, but they need not paralyze us. But that's what a crisis does at times. A, a crisis is, can be defined as a turning point where change is going to take place and either things are going to get better or they're going to get worse. But do you know what really affects the outcome of a crisis more than just about anything? It's our attitude. There are a couple things that I've learned from Scripture that helps us. And that is to have courage, which is the ability to do something that frightens us. And to be resolute. That is to decide firmly on a course of action. So where in Scripture do we find this courage and resolve? Well, the place I find it, uh, it comes from the last of the book of Exodus and the beginning of, of Joshua. In the last, or in Exodus is all about Moses. It's, it's, it's about Moses uh, primarily going before Pharaoh because he had, Witness that the, the, the Hebrews were enslaved to the Egyptians. God had seen this and wanted to set the people free. Chose Moses to go before Pharaoh, to stare Mo, uh, Pharaoh in the eye and say, let my people go. Now that took some courage to be able to go before the leader of the known world and demand freedom of his slaves. But Moses was able to do that because he was courageous. God had given him the courage and he had given him the resolve. Now, whenever they left Egypt, Moses leading the Hebrews out, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. Now, that took some courage and some resolve on Moses' part as well because it, people were grumbling. They were complaining. They were saying, why did you bring us out here to die in the desert? Why can't we go back to Egypt? At least there we had food. But he remained steadfast in his goal 
to deliver the people to the land that God had promised them, the land flowing with milk and honey. And it took 40 years for him to get up to that edge. The only thing that separated them at this moment was the River Jordan. On one side, Moses was standing there looking out on the other side. The other side, there was the land. The land filled with, I mean, flowing with milk and honey. The land that God had promised. This is where he had landed, I mean, he brought them to. And then he died. Now, this is where our scripture picks up. Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land I am giving them to the Israelites. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I have promised to Moses. From the wilderness and the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea of, in the west shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you, and I will not forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall put this people in possession of the land I swore to their ancestors to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to act in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, you shall meditate it on day and night so that you may be careful to act in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous. And then you shall be successful. I hereby command you, be strong, be courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So here we find courage and resolve. It is, these are two qualities that, that are being instilled in this new leader. I mean, after all, can you imagine Joshua who had been the second in command all of these years for for decades, and now, just as they are about to receive their reward, Moses dies. And he is challenged with the duty of leading the people across into this new land where it may be filled with milk and honey, but it was still an unknown territory. So these words were spoken for Joshua and for the leaders that he had appointed and for all the people to hear. It was for all the people to understand leadership and the transition of leadership. One of the things that they had found very quickly in Exodus, and Moses found this out, that leadership could not all focus on one person. It's too great of a responsibility. And so he had to appoint other leaders. And all of these leaders needed to understand that they needed courage and resolve. Now here at first, you are, you are blessed with some of the best leadership. You know, since this uh, coronavirus pandemic shutdown has kept us apart, your staff has stepped up and created new ways of making sure that you are connected with one another and that you're cared for and that the best we can that we continue uh, the, the services that we have provided 
fulfilling our mission. And it wasn't just the staff. It was also the lay leadership as well. I mean, the lay leaders stepped up. Nurture, outreach, witness, finance, trustees, SPR, church council, all of these leaders stepped up to try to make sure that the church not only survived, but thrived. I have to admit that I have been so pleased. It's been such a joy for me as the pastor here to have worked with so many dedicated people who, while they were unsure of what to do, they stepped up and they did what they could. And we are thriving. But here we are, just about to... to began this time of reopening and, and bringing the people back together in some form or fashion, probably beginning with outdoor worship. And what happens? A change of leadership. I'm leaving. Uh, a new pastor is coming in, and there's some angst and anxiety about that. But we remember, this is not the first. Oh, the circumstances may be a bit different. But this is not the first time that we've faced something like this. You know, it was just two years ago that I took over a role as pastor here when Terry Matthews' ministry ended. And as of July 1st, Jim Sanders will take over that role here at first as my ministry's in. But you know, I, I believe that God is speaking to Jim and to the the staff and to the lay leadership and to all of you to remind us all uh, that we all have to be courageous and resolute in our devotion and dedication to the mission and not to deviate from it but instead to live it, to meditate on it or as stated in verse 9 to be strong, to be resolute, and courageous, and not be frightened or dismayed. For God is with you wherever you may go. You know, friends, we don't know exactly what the next phase of life looks like. We don't know what it looks like whenever we're finally able to come back together and be a church in person. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know what's going to happen with all the protests. What kind of changes will they create? We don't know what will happen next year when General Conference finally decides the fate of the United Methodist Church? We don't even know what it's going to be like whenever you receive a new pastor and, or I re go to a new church. But God calls us to be courageous, to be resolute, and remind us that God is with us all the way. Amen. <laughs> Some glad morning when this life is over Celestial shore, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away when the shadows of this life have flown. I'll fly away 
Like a bird from prison bars has flown I'll fly away I'll fly away, oh glory I'll fly away When I die, hallelujah, by and by Glad and happy when we meet I'll fly away No more gold iron shackles on my feet I'll fly away I'll fly away Oh glory I'll fly away When I die You'll never end I'll fly away I'll fly away Oh glory I'll fly away When I die Hallelujah by and by close of today's service, my role as your pastor is almost all but officially complete. No longer will you turn to me for pastoral care, for counsel, for teaching, for leadership, for marrying and burying, or administering the sacraments. These roles are being passed on to the Reverend Jim Sanders, who is quite capable and very much filled with love. Now, let me be quite clear in this. Except for a rare occasion, I, like what is expected of every pastor, do not come back for funerals and or weddings. And I also rarely make contact with former members, at least for the first year. And this is not because I do not love you. It's, it's actually the opposite. It's because I do love you. You see, Jim will be your pastor, not me. He is the one who will need to be with you during those times of joy and especially in those moments of tragedy. He will be here to walk with you all the time and all the way through your twists and turns. He deserves your respect and mine of his ministry, and I will give him every opportunity to prosper and be your pastor. That word prosper, it's not a word that I just thoughtlessly threw in. Do you remember the video I showed right at the beginning of my message? Those, those words ended with Scott Carpenter saying, Godspeed, John Glenn. The word Godspeed is, is one that, that I use quite often. I, I almost bet that whenever you remember Anytime I wrote you a note or sent you an email, almost always it was signed, Godspeed, Pastor Tim. Why? Because of what it means. If you look up the definition of the word Godspeed, it, it comes from the Latin phrase, God spade, which means, may God prosper you. And that, my dear friends, is my hope and my prayer for each of you and for this church. So in all sincerity, I bid you, 
Godspeed.